good afternoon uh, ladies and gentlemen welcome uh, to the monthly clinical meeting organized by sri lanka medical association in collaboration with uh, sri lanka college of sexual health and hiv medicine so today uh, we have a broad topic of 35 years fight against hiv so today uh, to conduct the monthly clinical meeting we have three eminent speakers uh, dr arya ratna dr jayasurya and dr ratnayaka so i cordially invite all three speakers to the head table uh, so we will be starting with uh, dr ratnayaka uh, who is a coordinator on the strategic information national std and aids control program over to you sir good afternoon everyone uh, uh, thank you for the introduction and i would like to thank slma and the council of the sri lanka college of sexual health and hiv medicine uh, for providing me this opportunity to talk to you Uh, today uh, as the uh, the topic says my uh, what i'm going to do is to uh, very briefly give you an overview of sri lankan hiv uh, epidemic epidemiology and what are the challenges and what are the opportunities available for hiv prevention and provision of care for people uh, infected and affected with hiv now when we are talking about numbers of uh, people uh, infected or affected by hiv uh, there are two uh, we have to be mindful that there are two groups of people uh, that is newly diagnosed and reported in that particular year that is one category other one is uh, newly infected during that year so somebody can get infected about maybe several years ago 5 6 years ago or oh, even uh, maybe 10 years ago and get diagnosed and reported this year so it is one of the old infections but uh, on the other hand somebody can get infected during uh, this year so we considered the that that kind of people as newly infected uh, or new hiv infections now this graph shows the number of uh, people Uh, diagnosed and reported each year uh, from 2000 during last uh, 10 years and as you can see numbers are increasing uh, there is a slight decrease in 2020 and 2021 uh, most probably due to uh, covid related lockdowns uh, and service disruption uh, and again in 2022 uh, uh, there is a increased by about 48% compared to the previous year so the main reason for this increase uh, of infection is the number of males infected with hiv and uh, out of the uh, total number reported during last year uh, 88% have been uh, men on the other hand Uh, this line the green line shows the number of uh, women infected with hiv uh, so balanced uh, 12% is women so that number is fairly uh, stable and low compared to uh, the uh, the trend of uh, males and also uh, this slide shows uh, that only about 15% of people diagnosed and reported with hiv during last year uh, had symptoms symptoms uh, the balance 85% had been asymptomatic so the message is we don't have to wait till until they develop symptoms which might take maybe 8 uh, years 10 years or even more and what is the probable mode of transmission now this uh, slide gives the trend of probable mode of transmission during last 5 years and as you can see uh, which is indicated by blue color uh, the number of hiv uh, infected uh, people due to male to male sex is the uh, highest uh, component for example during last year 52% of people uh, out of the total they had they gave a history of male to male transmission and about one third is due to heterosexual 
transmission. And one significant thing is we don't have a higher percentage of uh, people uh, infected with HIV due to uh, injecting drug use compared to some of the other countries, both in Asian and uh, Western countries. So from which part of the country uh, they have uh, reported. Obviously, if you get absolute numbers, the districts with higher population will give a uh, higher number. For example, uh, Kalambu, Gampa, Kaluta, they have the population density is more. So to e equalize this, to cancel this effect, uh, we can calculate the, the proportion of people with HIV per 100,000 population. And this uh, map shows the rate of HIV infection per 100,000 population during last year, newly diagnosed and reported. And as you can see, uh, Kalambu Gampa uh, and Polonnaru also uh, shows a higher percentage, higher rate rather. Uh, about five per 100,000 population. And also, the southern uh, coastal belt, uh, districts in the southern coastal belt showed a higher rate. And this graph uh, shows the cumulative number of people and divided by the, the population as a rate per 100,000 population. So the high, highest rate is from Kalambu district. So, so this is not due to higher population, but due to higher risk in uh, urban uh, districts. And also you can see uh, Putlam, uh, Gampaha, Kalutara, Gol, and even Polonarua showed a uh, higher HIV rate compared to the other districts. Right. Now, uh, we can't, you know, not all the HIV infected cases are reported to uh, our system. So therefore, we make an estimation as to how many people should be there with HIV infection. So we do this exercise every year. And uh, recently, we did this uh, about, uh, we con concluded uh, two months ago. According to that estimate, we assume that there should be around 4,100 uh, people living with HIV. And uh, of this, uh, the number diagnosed and living are about uh, is about 3,515, which is 86 uh, percent. So, if you get uh, out of the total, uh, only 72 percent, or nearly 3,000 people, are in clinical services. Uh, this is also uh, at the end of uh, last year. And also, this is a very uh, useful uh, analysis uh, in HIV epidemiology called uh, cascade analysis. So we updated these numbers uh, for last year based on the new estimations. And you can see 86%, uh, uh, which I already mentioned, uh, that is 3,515 people uh, are living and they have been diagnosed with HIV. The other other we, uh, they have not uh, been identified. And uh, out of the total number, 68%, or uh, if you take the absolute number, 2,813 are on antiretroviral treatment. And out of the total uh, estimated uh, number of people living with HIV, that is 4,100, only 59% uh, have had uh, viral load suppression. If you get an ab absolute number, uh, 1,660. So this is roughly our status uh, as end of 2022, last year. So what are the new opportunities available for HIV prevention and provision of care? So these, uh, I have listed some of them and some of these uh, options were not available uh, maybe several uh, years ago, five, six years ago. Now we have the ability uh, 
to provide HIV services virtually or through online methods. And uh, this website uh, called knowforsure.lk, people can log in and request H, uh, HIV services and also book an appointment and also measure their risk of HIV uh, by going through. So this is open to public, which we completed, uh, updated last year. And also HIV diagnosis, uh, which Dr. Nimal is going to talk to you in detail uh, after my uh, talk. Uh, now we have a rapid HIV test and the result will be available uh, within 20 minutes. Earlier, people had to give a sample of blood and they have to come back after one week. And also, now HIV testing is available as a home-based self-test, which is uh, almost unheard uh, several years ago. And also, the, the antiretroviral treatment is the antiviral drug given for HIV infection. And uh, these modern HIV, uh, anti-HIV drugs or antiretroviral drugs uh, has the ability to uh, reduce viral load or the amount of viruses in the blood to an undetectable level within weeks and their side effects are minimal. And also, uh, once the viral load is undetectable, uh, the sexual transmission uh, is, uh, can be eliminated almost, and also it will uh, prevent or eliminate mother-to-child transmission. So these are uh, the, the options available to us uh, for HIV prevention and treatment, new ones. And also these uh, biomedical HIV interventions were not available again a uh, few uh, years ago. So they, now the treatment as prevention, uh, I mean, we started way back in 2016. Prior to that, we had to wait until the CD4 count drops to a certain level before we start antiretroviral treatment. But now, as soon as we diagnose a patient with HIV, we start them on treatment. So that will not only improve their health status, uh, and also, it will prevent sexual transmission from that person to uh, other people. And also pre-exposure prophylaxis. That is, HIV negative people can uh, take uh, these, some of these antiretroviral drugs to prevent uh, HIV infection. Uh, and we have uh, initiated this uh, facility also uh, now for last two, three years and we are in the process of uh, scaling it up to, uh, other to all the districts. And post-exposed prophylaxis, that is if somebody get exposed to uh, potential HIV infection uh, through a needle stick injury or through unprotected sex, we can give certain antiretroviral treatment to reduce uh, that person infecting, getting infected with HIV. So, uh, so now this U equal U, uh, which is given in uh, green, is very empowering to people living with HIV, because if their viral load is undetectable, uh, they, they are not going to transmit the virus to their sexual partners. And also, uh, we have these high-risk groups, so communities called key populations, uh, who have a very higher risk of uh, uh, HIV infections compared to the others. Uh, now, according to UNAIDS, for example, uh, men who have sex with men are having, uh, I mean, their risk is 20 times higher than uh, other men of the same age group. And those who inject drugs also have 22 times higher risk of getting HIV. Sex workers, 21. Transgender women, 12 times. And prisoners also, uh, five to 10 times higher. So these five groups are internationally classified as uh, key populations. Uh, they, are, they are the people who drive HIV uh, epidemic. Right, now stigma and discrimination is a big obstacle to HIV prevention. And according to these uh, studies, uh, there is a significant uh, 
effect of stigma and discrimination uh, for people living with HIV. Now we have to uh, uh, provide education and advocacy and also we have to develop some policies uh, to protect uh, these uh, people living with HIV and also key populations. Otherwise, uh, those who are coming forward to HIV testing will be less and also they are more likely to uh, lose to follow up for HIV treatment. So that is uh, detrimental to our uh, prevention activities. So we have to get the involvement of community. Uh, now we have several uh, 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 community-based organizations, civil society organizations. Uh, I have listed some of them, but there are many now. Uh, so some of these organizations are comprised of people living with HIV, and others are working uh, for key populations. So as National STD AIDS Control Program, we always try to uh, work with these organizations uh, to uh, improve the services because ultimately they are the people who are more likely to uh, affected and infected with HIV uh, epidemic. Now, lack of sexual education in Sri Lanka is one of the major challenges. As you, as you know, uh, there, is a, uh, there is no comprehensive sexual education uh, in schools uh, and also in universities for that matter. Uh, and as a result, uh, young people are at, uh, you know, their knowledge is limited. Uh, so we have to, uh, uh, we have to start age appropriate sexual education. Uh, otherwise, you know, these numbers will go further up. So as you can see here in this graph, uh, 73 people got newly infected, but they were young people, those who were in 15 to 24. Uh, so overall, about 10 to 15 percent of uh, all HIV infections belong to this particular age category. So proper sex education uh, might decrease at least uh, most of these uh, infections. And other uh, uh, major uh, achievement we received uh, in the area of HIV uh, infection is elimination of uh, uh, mother-to-child transmission of uh, HIV and also syphilis. We got the WHO certification as a country uh, which has eliminated mother-to-child transmission in 2019. Uh, and also we uh, underwent a rigorous process again to revalidate the process because every two years we had to prove that we are still on track. So we got the revalidation re also in uh, 2021. However, uh, recently, uh, early this year as well as uh, end of last year, we detected three, four cases uh, of mother-to-child transmitted cases because they were uh, sick and got admitted to uh, pediatric wards and they have done HIV test and they have found to be HIV positive. So this graph is according to the uh, year of the year of birth. So we thought, you know, after uh, getting validation, there will be zero uh, cases, but there are a few sporadic cases still happening. Uh, main reason is we had uh, lack of resources for HIV testing, and also there is a complacency about healthcare workers that uh, because the recommendation is if there is a mother coming to delivery without uh, having a proper uh, HIV test history, uh, negative history, they have to do a rapid test uh, before the delivery uh, and make sure that that HIV positive patient is negative. Uh, then we can uh, do certain interventions to prevent mother to child transmission. And also, uh, we also talk a lot about ending AIDS in Sri Lanka. As you know, according to uh, sustainable development goals, uh, target uh, 3.1 uh, 3 .1 by 2030, uh, most of the countries in the world, almost all countries in the world, had promised to end AIDS epidemic as a public health threat. So what is ending AIDS? Ending AIDS does not mean that eliminating HIV infection altogether. 
uh, it has a definition, has a definition which is definition. the new infections, the new infections should, should be less than 90% compared to the 2010 baseline value and also AIDS death should be reduced by 90% compared to the baseline value in uh, 2010. So what is our progress so far? So I have given two graphs here, uh, the, the one with red uh, title represent the estimated new HIV infection. These are new infec ex estimations because we don't know uh, we can't calculate uh, whether it is a new infection or old infection. So only method available is estimation. So we are in the correct track, but we haven't, uh, we have, and also deaths also reducing because of the antiretroviral treatment program. Uh, but we have to work more to reduce it by more than 90%. And to end AIDS, there is a target that has to be achieved by 2025. So that target everybody knows as 95, 95, 95. So this is the new target set by UNAIDS. According to that one, 95% of all people living with HIV should know their HIV status or they should be diagnosed. And out of them, at least 95% should be uh, started on antiretroviral treatment. And of them, at least 95% should be uh, virally suppressed. So that means they have to keep on giving antiretroviral treatment uh, and they have to come uh, for appointments, then only that can be achieved. So below I have given, but we have achieved last by last year, 2022. So, 86% according to the estimation, 86% uh, know their status, 80% of them only 80% on ART, and those who are on ART, uh, out of them 87% uh, have been virally suppressed. So other biggest challenge is the issue of resources. And as you know, Sri, uh, government of Sri Lanka is the main financial contributor to the national response to HIV epidemic in Sri Lanka. Uh, however, as you know, because of the financial crisis which happened uh, very recently, we had a lot of uh, unwanted issues. For example, it affected procurement of antiretroviral uh, medication and procurement of test reagents like essential tests to monitor patients on HIV medication and uh, viral load testing. And also, there was a shortage of test kits at one time, and that affected antenatal testing, uh, and also testing of key populations. Uh, and also, recruitment of some uh, essential staff got uh, held up still because of this financial uh, crisis, decisions taken based on the financial crisis. And also, uh, some of the specialists who served in, uh, you know, in Sri Lanka, both in Colombo as well as outside districts, left the country. So that also uh, affected because of the uh, lack of uh, resources. So yesterday also we had a, a meeting uh, how to optimize the available resources and how to optimize uh, HIV prevention. So some of the, the decisions uh, uh, we came yesterday, uh, there should be a proper advocacy or maybe you know improved advocacy to government of Sri Lanka to allocate adequate resources. Usually allocation is there, but disbursement is not there because of the crisis. But uh, so if you, if you do not get adequate resources, then all the achievements will uh, go, I mean, it will uh, go back. Uh, and the other thing is, we have to get an extension to Global Fund grant. So even now, uh, we got uh, antiretroviral medication from the Global Fund grant because we can't uh, afford to stop people getting antiretroviral treatment. And also yesterday, uh, we were talking about with the uh, private sector can help like you know some other diseases uh, for the HIV response. So with that, I'm going to stop. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Ayuratna. Thank you, Dr. Uh, next, I would like to call upon Dr. Nimali Jayasurya, the coordinator HIV testing, STI care and EMTCT, National STD and AIDS Control Program.
Over to you, Dr. Jayasuri. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, today I'm going to talk on uh, diagnosing HIV. Are we in the correct direction? OK. We'll start with uh, really is HIV diagnosis is challenging. So we'll start with the HIV virology. Uh, HIV is a RNA virus, and it's uh, in, under retrovirus groups. And there are mainly two types, HIV-1 and 2. HIV-1, again, classified into MN, O, and P. And also, uh, M is the most widely spread uh, uh, subtype in worldwide. And the HIV structure, so it uh, as a usual structure, it has an envelope, capsid, and uh, RNA and uh, some enzymes, and it's very much important to know the structure because to diagnose this H diagnosing of HIV, the structure is very much important, and also uh, to initiation of ART or the ART production, the structure is very much important. So the HIV natural history, the typical cause of infection if, if, if untreated. So if not treated with ART, this is the typical cause of infection. So when uh, somewhat get the, uh, someone gets the infection or they acquired the infection after like two to eight uh, weeks, uh, they can get some like uh, flu-like symptoms, uh, like like a viral fever. Whether they treat the, whether they get treatment or not, it will uh, subside. Then after like uh, after that, uh, usually to like uh, eight to twelve years, there there is an asymptomatic period. Then they started to develop symptoms like mild symptoms initially, and later on they ended end up with AIDS. And if they are not treated, the final outcome will be death. So the, the clinical presentations of HIV, the initially the acute uh, infection or the acute retroviral syndrome or the primary infection or the flu-like infection, the, these are the symptoms. And the common symptoms are like like you know, viral fever. Fever, enlarged lymph nodes, skin rash, and uh, muscle pain, myalgia, body aches, and so on. And also the clinical presentation, as I told before, the initial, the stage one, uh, there will not be any symptoms. Some ca some can have a, a generalized lymphadenopathy, but it's usually reactive lymph nodes. In the stage two, they can have minor uh, mucocutaneous, especially the skin infections and the nail infections, and also mild weight loss with some uh, respiratory tract infection. And the stage three, uh, usually they can get unexpected, like uh, unexplained uh, diarrhea, fever, thrombocytopenia, anemia, weight loss, TB, and so on. And the stage four is the AIDS, that's uh, there they get uh, AIDS defining illness, like example, PCP pneumonia, toxoplasma, CME, uh, and some malignancies, and so on. Okay. So as uh, Dr. Ariratna uh, discussed before, the, we have a common goal, actually uh, uh, declared by UNAIDS to ending AIDS in 2030. In Sri Lanka also, we are working on that to ending AIDS in 2030. The ending AIDS means 90% reduction in HIV incidence and mortality by 2030 compared to baseline year 2010. So how can we are how can we going to ending AIDS in Sri Lanka? So we have to reduce infections and reduce AIDS related deaths. So reduce new infections means we have to prevent HIV transmission and as well as prevention of HIV acquisition. So reduce AIDS related deaths means we have to diagnose early, we have to treat early, and we have to uh, they have to have good and adherence and they have to uh, retain in the Care. So this is what we want to achieve, and the baseline, you all can see the baseline is a, a light blue color one, the Sri Lankan baseline, but we have to do, like, we have to fast track everything to achieve ending AIDS in 2030. The preventive aspects and the treatment, diagnosis, all have to be fast track if we ending AIDS in 2030. Why we need to focus on HIV testing? So HIV testing is the key to treatment and prevention. Uninfected people, they can get the infection and they end up with people living with HIV. And through the PLHIV, the people living with HIV, it can be transmitted to uninfected population. 
So the if we uh, scale up prevention services, we can prevent HIV acquisition. We can, if we treat them properly and with good adherence, we can prevent transmission. For you all can see for prevention as well as treatment, the key, the key gate or the key is HIV testing. We have to do test and if positive, we have to start treatment. If negative, we have to link them to preventive services. So treatment as prevention has already discussed. Uh, 052 clinical trials and partner study demonstrated that ART effectively suppress uh, the person's viral load and to an undetectable load, uh, viral level give rise to zero transmission from like un uninfected sexual partner to another um, infected sexual partner to another un uh, uh, infected sexual partner. So the clinical trials provided the crucial scientific uh, uh, evidence that undetectable means untransmutable. So U equal U equal U equal U means if we try if we start treatment and if they become undetectable viral load, there is more, no more transmission. If we can identify all HIV positive patients and initiate treatment and become undetectable viral load, there is no further transmission. The key is we have to diagnose them. So diagnosis of HIV, is it easy to diagnose? Clinical diagnosis of HIV is often difficult because, uh, as you all know, the acute seroconversion or the primary infection, it's just like a flu, in, flu or the viral infection. So we can't differentiate whether it's a primary, in, primary HIV infection or viral infection. And also, there is a long asymptomatic period, and the Third one is the symptomatic stage. Again, it's non-specific to HIV. There are these uh, uh, the clinical uh, symptoms or the diseases are common among the other immunosuppressive disorders as well. So the clinical diagnosis is no way in diagnosis of HIV. The main or the the main or the key way of diagnosis of HIV is the laboratory diagnosis. So the undiagnosed HIV infection has two major consequences. One is the, there is transmission risk uh, through the uninfected people. And also they have found that uh, HIV transmission uh, is 26 times greater during first three months of uh, infection rather than the chronic infection. And also individuals who are diagnosed late, uh, late they can end up with uh, uh, serious illness. Okay. Diagnosis of HIV, are we in the correct direction? So the evolving of HIV testing in Sri Lanka, so we had earlier, the early stage, we had HIV antibody test. It, in, uh, in the very early, we had second generation test, then the third generation antibody test. The, now we have the HIV antibody and antigen, both tests like this, both test together. So the antigen antibody test is, test is the most the, one of the most sensitive method, and uh, the usually and the commonly we use this uh, antigen antibody test. The other thing is the DMAS test is the NAT or the nucleic acid test uh, to diagnose early infection. So the, the window period that is the uh, the the time which can uh, test can identify the HIV infection in a human being. The DNA PCR or the NAT test the in window period is very much early. Within 10 days, we can start diagnosis, can, but can go up to 30 days. HIV antigen antibody, usually we use two types of test, ELISA and rapid HIV antigen antibody test. Uh, the ELISA is more sensi sensitive than the rapid, but the window period is uh, eight days to 18 days to 16, six weeks. So it's again become shorter. The HIV antibody test, but which is the which we had earlier, so the window period is 21 days to three months. So those all types of tests actually we it's available in Sri Lanka in the National Reference Laboratory. So there are several HIV testing options actually. Initially we had only laboratory based or the normal routine blood testing methods with antibody testing. Now it's available, the point of care rapid testing. The results will be available within 20, 20 minutes, actually. The laboratory base usually, it, it, it usually takes five to sometimes five to seven days. And also the, now, 
Uh, HIV self-test is also available. It's an antibody test. The window period is three months, and the results will be available in uh, 20 minutes. And the NAT test also available. And the HIV testing approaches, and the, what are the methods of HIV testing? There are three types, mainly three types of methods of HIV testing, as I told before, laboratory testing. So the usual, as usual. So we send a sample to the laboratory. So the report will be available in one or within one week. So the, the next one is the community-based testing. As Dr. Ari Ratna said, the, the high-risk groups, actually, they are sometimes not willing to come to the laboratory, the, the clinical settings or the hospital to give their blood. Uh, so due to stigma or any other any other reason. So so beyond that, actually, we uh, the our the STD staff or the community-based workers they are going to the field and they do community-based testing, mostly HIV rapid or sometimes uh, assisted self-testing. Apart from that, actually, some people they are not like they are not willing to have like uh, to draw their blood uh, from someone else. So they, they, for those people, actually, we have introduced self-testing. They can have the testing, the self-test. It's an aura quick or the, the, or the uh, test based on uh, saliva. So they can do the test at their home or any private place. So the, uh, the thing is, uh, the, then uh, uh, usually we do a HIV screening test. So the, the test I have already discussed, the uh, laboratory-based, uh, laboratory-based ELISA, rapid, self-test, or uh, like those kind of tests, actually those are screening tests. Those tests can, those tests have, has to be, have to be uh, confirmed by another confirmatory single test or uh, 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 one or two uh, tests. So initially, actually, uh, we confirm uh, the screening test by the Western blot. But beyond that, actually, so the, the turnaround time for the, the Western blot, sometimes it's maybe one or two weeks. So the most important thing is uh, if one is positive, we need to link them to the care as soon as possible. So for that, actually, we have introduced three rapid test algorithms. So there we do three rapid tests on the, uh, the day one. And the, on the same day, we uh, repeat the three tests uh, with a fresh sample. If the two samples are positive for three rapid tests, then the, uh, there we confirm that that patient is having HIV infection. On the same day, we can confirm the patient. On the same day, we can link to the care. On the same day, we can start antiretroviral treatment as well. So what are the testing services entry points? There are several testing services, uh, the entry points available, uh, available in all over the country. The main uh, center is the STI services, so the STD clinics. There are 41 STD clinics in uh, island-wide. Usually, the patients who are having STIs and also the risk population or sometimes asymptomatic patients are coming for uh, testing services for the STD clinics. And also the partner. So one, uh, someone is positive, we trace partners. So uh, from that also, uh, the, the persons are linked to testing services through partner notification. And the provide initiated testing, usually it happens in hospital, uh, hospital testing, TB clinics and hepatitis patients. So those people actually come for another reason or another illness or a, uh, another complaint. But as healthcare providers, healthcare persons, they initiated HIV testing depend on their risk. And the opt-out method, actually in pregnant, opt-out means it's we uh, opt, the we offer HIV tests for a large population. So as you all know, in Sri Lanka, all pregnant, pregnant women are screened for HIV testing. So we offer HIV testing, the HIV test for the all pregnant women, and if they're not willing, they can opt out from the HIV testing services. And the most important things, one of the most important thing is the community-based testing. That is the main way of tracking high-risk populations. So the community uh, leaders or the NGO workers, they work on that and they go to the field and test uh, uh, the high-risk groups uh, in the community. And also private sector setting, as you all know, as usual, in high-risk or symptomatic or asymptomatic, whatever the way, the 
the, the private sector testing also happening. And the other thing is blood bank. Uh, uh, all blood donors who are donating blood in Sri Lanka have, uh, the, uh, will be checked for HIV antigen antibody uh, test uh, as a screening test. Actually, this is the HIV positivity rate by category by testing 2022. So you all can see we have screened the blood donors 424,127 and we found 58. That is general population. Antenatal mothers, it's nine. And nine we have detected out of 185,569. Private hospitals, 130. STD clinic sample, that is the uh, highest yield. There are 37,423 screened and 288 were confirmed positive. And triforces 11, hospital-based testing. Actually, we have done only 2,658 were positive. Apart from that, uh, there are many samples. This Actually, the hospital-based testing means we have provided rapid test, HIV rapid test to the laboratories of the hospital, and they, uh, they themselves do HIV rapid on the hospital patients. Apart from that, from all the most of the hospitals, directly they send sample to the STD clinic and we detect more than that. And also prison 3, TB screening 8, and pre-employment 1. And the, uh, the key population intervention programs, that is community-based testing, that is also has highest, the high yield. We have screened 22,150 um, and 85 were confirmed positive. So, you, so the thing is, uh, uh, we can identify that uh, the, the screening general population is not cost effective. We have to ta we have to do testing for targeted uh, uh, targeted population. So, at the moment, we are doing uh, from our program. So, this already discussed by. Uh, Dr. Ari Razna, are we effectively screened for HIV people with high risk previous? Are we really screening those people? As said, as uh, earlier said, there are few high risk groups, female sex workers, injecting drug users, transgender women, and MSM. So in STD clinic, yes, we do screening these people, but in outside the STD clinic from the, by the GPs or the hospital settings or any other uh, clinical settings are these people are considered at high risk and uh, they are screened for HIV. These are the high risk groups, uh, men having sex with men, transgender women who have sex with men, people who inject drugs, people who have multiple sexual partners or changing partners, a partner whose HIV status unknown or person diagnosed with HIV with a detect detectable viral load, or any contact of sexual health injecting partner which may having high risk beer. So when uh, those people are coming to any like clinical settings, we have to think of doing or offering HIV testing because these are the high risk groups for the HIV. Do you all can see the risk of transmission? It's uh, 36 times, 26 times, 34 times. The risk is very much high uh, when compared to the general population. And an another important thing is the index case testing and network testing. Are we doing adu adequately? The uh, index case means the partners. The partner may be sexual partner, injecting partner, may be biological child or biological mother. Are we uh, uh, partner tracing? Are we doing partner notification adequately? I think it's uh, it's. Uh, I think no. So there are our patients, but sometimes it's very much difficult to trace partners. If we can trace the partners, the yield is very much high. That we know that that patient has a contact. The probability of having HIV is very much high. So we have to improve our partner notification as well. The another thing is the network testing. Actually, this is uh, mainly for the. Uh, men having sex with men and injecting drug users, so they have networks. So if we find a one person in that network, if we can track the network so the, we can find more HIV positives rather than doing uh, millions of HIV tests in general population. So the network testing is also very important. At the moment we do, but we have to upgrade. The other thing is, uh, is provide initial testing optimal in healthcare setting? Is it optimal? So that there are certain conditions, actually there are clinical conditions which indicates for HIV testing. But the thing is, when in the hospital, 
Sometimes these patients are repeatedly coming into the hospital settings, but they are not screened for HIV. So we have to think of uh, HIV testing in these uh, clinical conditions, especially sexually transmitted infection. If one STI means uh, there is a risk of transmission of other STIs as well. So need to offer HIV testing. And the TB, pneumocystis pneumonia, recurrent bacterial infections, uh, cerebral toxoplasmosis, cerebral lymphoma, cryptococcal meningitis, and other malignancies like Kaposi's sarcoma, uh, esophageal candidiasis, uh, non-Hodgkin lymphoma, and invasive cervical cancer, and the cytomegalo viral retinitis. So these conditions are actually uh, HIV, the conditions which indicated for HIV testing. There are some uh, conditions actually they are not indicated, but we have to consider or it's better to consider HIV testing in these conditions when someone comes to your settings with these symptoms. So unexplained weight loss, uh, unexplained loss of appetite, pyrexia of unknown origin, unexplained anemia, unexplained lymphadenopathy, unexplained thrombocytopenia, recurrent and severe skin problems and recurrent ENT. Infections. If we trace, the thing is, out of all reported cases, 15% of people with uh, symptomatic actually. So, if we do uh, early the screen, if we do screening early, so we can diagnose early, and we can prevent transmission, and also we can prevent further uh, uh, severe illness. So the reported deaths uh, due to AIDS during uh, 2015 to 2020, you all can see it's like rising. So last year, AIDS-related deaths were 66 percent, 66 cases. So there are still there are AIDS cases are reporting. It's due to late diagnosis. When someone come to a hospital, the, especially for the hospital setting, think of HIV. Uh, uh, as a differential diagnosis, then we can easily end uh, ending AIDS in 2030 by early diagnosis. So are we in correct direction? So yes, we are in the correct direction, but thing is we have to need to scale up. So scale up means uh, that we have to uh, key population testing, that is the targeted key population testing, we have to scale up and index case testing, social networking, Screening of youth, as you all see, the, now the youth, the number of youth reported with HIV is very much high. So we have to uh, target youth as well and vulnerable groups as well. And also screening of symptomatic patients. We have to screen all TB patients, all hepatitis patients, and provide initial testing at healthcare settings. So when someone come to your uh, door, uh, if if the if if uh, that person is having high risk behavior or some symptoms suggestive of HIV, please do provide initiated HIV testing. And also we have to expand testing across multiple departments and hospital, not only one department of hospital at each level, if possible, like each unit, the ICU, ETU, any ward, we have to expand all uh, testing services in hospitals, then uh, we can find more cases. Okay, so what is the way forward? So the newest method is the using uh, recent assays. Recent assays means to diagnose, identify HIV early infection. So there they use, actually there are rapid tests as well. There are, they, are, they use biomarkers to identify person with the infect very recently. So they are by actually we can trace partners very easily and also we can track the epidemic and we can, if, the, if there is recent infection in some area we can uh, promote preventive services and we can track and control the epidemic. That's uh, all I have to tell and thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jayaswari. Uh, next, we have the last speaker uh, for today's clinical meeting, Dr. Tilly Ratnayak, who is a consultant venereologist, STD clinic from Teaching Hospital on Radhapura. Over to you, Dr. Ratnayak. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, first, I would like to uh, thank uh, SLMA, President, Secretary, and the Council for giving us this opportunity on behalf of Sri Lanka College of Sexual Health and HIV Medicine. For next uh, 20 to 25 minutes, I'll be talking about uh, pediatric HIV infection. Here, um, the content of this uh, lecture. 
I'm going to touch global and Sri Lankan situation of pediatric HIV, risk of mother-to-child transmission of HIV, clinical presentation briefly, prevention of mother-to-child transmission strategies, uh, that is uh, ART in pregnancy, safe delivery, safe feeding options, and I'll be talking about a uh, little bit about disclosing HIV status to children. So um, worldwide, um, there are about 1.7 million children living with HIV under the age of 15. And um, when it comes to new infection, it is estimated in 2020, there are um, 160,000 new HIV infection in, among pediatric age group. And, but um, we are seeing a, a positive picture here. The number of uh, infections are going down in pediatric age group compared to adults. And this is um, actually a result of successful um, pre uh, PMTCT programs established throughout the world. And in Sri Lanka, a cumulative number reported in pediatric HIV infection is 98, and 2022, um, Total number of pregnant women with HIV delivered is 18, and we didn't have any new pediatric infections. When it comes to mother-to-child transmission, HIV infection can occur during pregnancy, during delivery, and breastfeeding. And um, we know that very well. And uh, uh, the overall risk of HIV transmission from mother to child, if there are no any in interventions, it comes to like 25 to 45 percent. And when compared to sexual transmission, this is very much higher. And uh, mm, the latter part of the pregnancy and breastfeeding has a, a, a higher risk compared to uh, uh, early part of pregnancy. And um, this risk can bring down to less than 1 percent with proper treatment. So what are the risk factors for mother-to-child transmission of HIV? The main risk factor is maternal viral load. And load CD4 count, premature rupture of membranes, preterm delivery, low birth weight, and duration of breastfeeding and breast infection also matters. And um, pediatric um, HIV has a high mortality. It can go up to 60%. And also the disease progression in children is much rapid than uh, it in adults. And when you uh, look at the viral burden, the number of copies uh, in infants is much more higher than uh, that of in adults. And I, um, I'm not going to talk, a, a talk in detail about the clinical presentation. And it is very much similar to uh, clinical presentation in adults. And Dr. Nimali uh, talked to you about that uh, clinical symptoms. And in um, uh, children also, we see uh, um, four stages according to WHO, clinical stage one to four. Four is the more serious uh, stage with more immune deficiency where we see a lot of uh, opportunistic infections. And uh, stage one is asymptomatic. And um, the clinical presentation is, is much more similar to adult, but we see some um, features more and a more common uh, or sometimes a different picture in some areas in children. Um, failure to thrive, HIV wasting syndrome, and bacterial and viral infections, and skin manifestations are, are commonly seen among HIV infected children. And these are some of them. Uh, extensive viral wart infection, herpes zoster. Uh, children can present with hepatosplenomegaly, oral, oral candida and uh, bilateral uh, parotid swelling. This is due to uh, lymphocytic infiltration and lymphocytic interstitial pneumonia. This is another common manifestation among children. And TB lymphadenopathy, malnutrition and severe wasting, extensive molluscum, and PCP. So I can go on and on, but these are some of the common. So um, now I'm going to talk about the success story. This uh, uh, infection uh, can be prevented by timely interventions, including ART. And successful mother-to-child uh, uh, PMTCT programs um, have been, um, have prevented about 2.5 million infant infections in the world. 
and successful PMTCT programs have prevented about 1.2 million uh, pediatric deaths. And as you all know, we have uh, done the same thing, and uh, uh, we um, worked on this elimination of mother-to-child transmission of HIV and syphilis, and we achieved the goal, and we fulfilled these targets. These are the process targets, and these are the impact targets. Although you can uh, list it easily like one, two, three, four, but it was a very, very um, big effort, not only from us. It was a team effort with many stakeholders, and by uh, doing all these um, uh, hard work, in 2019, uh, we got the certification from WHO as a country that eliminated mother-to-child transmission. And in 2021, we had the revalidation as well. And we are still maintaining. And so what are the uh, strategies in PMTCT? These are the basic strategies. Which, uh, the first initial strategy is testing all pregnant mothers for HIV. And uh, then uh, second one, ART for all HIV positive mothers, then safe mode of delivery, safe infant feeding, and ART prophylaxis for baby for six months. If we can achieve all these five steps successfully, we can bring down this 45% to 0%. So uh, testing is very important. I think Dr. Nimali uh, talked about antenatal testing. And um, we have a national policy um, for HIV and syphilis testing for pregnant mother. This circular was issued in 2014 under the EMTCT program, which recommend that all pregnant mothers should uh, be screened for HIV and syphilis at 12 weeks of pregnancy, before 12 weeks of uh, pregnancy. And all who are positive should be referred and properly uh, um, treated. So ART in pregnancy is, is a, a main uh, strategy. All HIV positive mothers should receive ART, and most ARTs are safe in pregnancy. The aim is to bring down the viral load to undetectable level because maternal viral load is an independent fac factor for uh, mother-to-child transmission of HIV. And it has been shown in many studies and this is a study done in Malawi, and which clearly showed when mother's viral load is more than 1,000, the transmission risk is very high. And when it is undetectable, when it is less than 40 copies, the transmission risk is very low. And by 2020, over 80% of pregnant women in the world are receiving um, ART for their HIV infection. So as a result, we can clearly see the number of children acquiring HIV uh, going down. So what is the mode of delivery for HIV positive mothers? Here we are talking about two methods, normal vaginal delivery and planned cesarean section. So um, normal vaginal delivery is, a, uh, is an option when the mother is on treatment and her viral load is very well under control, less than uh, 50 copies at the at 36 weeks of pregnancy. Then she can go for a planned vaginal delivery, and there's no significant difference whether she goes for a normal vaginal delivery or a cesarean section. And planned uh, uh, lower segment cesarean section is, is, is good when mother is not on treatment and mother is uh, not under control. And the risk uh, in delivery can go up when there, are, uh, when there are invasive procedures involved, prolonged rupture of membranes, and preterm labor. And feeding options, what, are the, what is the most safe method? Here we got two options, exclusive breastfeeding or replacement feeding. There's no in between. So mixed feeding is not recommended. And it is um, uh, well known that mixed feeding is, is much riskier for HIV transmission than exclusive breastfeeding or exclusive uh, replacement feeding formula. So we all know breastfeeding uh, has um, many, many benefits for both mother and baby. And WHO recommend exclusive breastfeeding for all infants uh, within the first six months of life to prevent 87% of infant deaths. On the other hand, when it comes to HIV, breastfeeding um, has a risk and uh, about 15 to 20% additional risk if mother continue to breastfeed for 18 to 24 months. 
and mother's viral load, directly responsible for viral load in the breast milk and uh, transmission through breastfeeding. So what are the options for uh, infant feeding? Replacement feeding or non-breastfeeding is an option when mother is not on ART or my, her viral load is not under control. But uh, in that situation, there should be a continuous supply of a safe formula feeding uh, for first uh, months of life. And um, exclusive breastfeeding uh, with ART. Um, the ART has made uh, breastfeeding safe. So mothers who are on ART and when their viral load is uh, very well under control, the breast milk has very low chance of transmitting HIV. So WHO recommend for low income countries where the HIV prevalence is very high, like more than 10%, um, if, if safe replacement feeding is not feasible, mothers can breastfeed but under the cover of ART. And uh, if I tell you a little bit about our setup, our numbers are very low, and our campaign provide um, formula milk free of charge for all um, infants and for uh, first 12 months. So even so, most of the time, our practice is to for uh, replacement feeding or formula feeding. But it's not um, hard and fast if mother uh, doesn't like to um, go for formula feed. If she wants to breastfeed, even her um, viral load is un uh, under control, it, she can do that under the cover of ART. And the, la the next st step is infant prophylaxis. All infants exposed to HIV should receive ART prophylaxis for first six months. But if mother continue to uh, breastfeed, then ART prophylaxis for baby should also continue. And infant diagnosis um, is, when it comes to infant diagnosis, it's a, it's a challenge. Antibody testing has a, a, a low uh, value here. So we need to go for molecular testing um, for HIV RNA PCR or HIV DNA PCR because uh, passive transfer of maternal antibodies can uh, give a positive, false positive result within the first 18 months. And um, I'm not going into detail about testing. Uh, confirmation needs two, uh, uh, two positive tests in two separate occasions. And um, ART for uh, all positive infants and children is recommended as soon as they are confirmed as HIV positive. And it has been shown in many studies, early initiation of ART has a very good uh, clinical outcome in terms of improved growth and neurological and cognitive development. And this is another study which has shown uh, early initiation of ART and, and the association of fast uh, um, increase in the ISAD score. Um, globally, more than 45% of children still uh, not on ART even though they are HIV positive because mainly they are not diagnosed. So. I will um, touch a little bit about disclosing, disclosure of HIV status. When um, a child is HIV positive, when are we going to tell the child that uh, he or she is HIV positive? And at the same time, there's another uh, uh, side of it. When parents are HIV positive, when, when is child going to know about parent status? And majority of HIV positive children do not know their HIV status. There are many reasons, maybe parents believing they are too young to understand, maybe they will get stressed or depressed and child may not keep the secret, maybe the fear of asking questions about parents' transmission and uh, they might fear that child might blame the parent or, or fear of discrimination. Sometimes they want to tell, but they do not know how to tell. So. Um, so it is not to disclose too early and not to be too late. So it, what WHO recommend is tell the child before they start their uh, sexual life. So what they recommend is a child should know his or uh, her HIV status at, uh, at the ch uh, when they are going to school or at the age of 12, they should know their state. At the same way, they should know their parents' HIV status by the age of 12. 
and they should this this should not be a very quick thing this should be a process they should start discussion at the age of 5 to 6 and and finish by 12 years that's what they recommend but this can vary from individual to individual and from one society to other society and it has been shown hiv disclosure has been associated with very positive outcomes rather than negative outcomes but in spite of uh, doing all these efforts things can go wrong so um, where we can go uh, wrong is not or, or diagnosing or missing um, hiv in pregnancy new infections uh, in pregnancy especially the latter part of the pregnancy and mothers not receiving art in pregnancy or maybe they are receiving but they are not compliant enough to maintain the viral load in a in a low level and new infections during breastfeeding so with that um, i'm going to my last two slides this is about a, a case study recently reported to um, a campaign um, this is a, this family the father died of hiv and um, uh, he was suffering from severe pneumonia and then uh, got to know that he was uh, positive while he was in the hospital and then wife was tested and found positive and uh, then we went into details of the family the first child uh, was uh, died at the age of 3 years due to severe pneumonia and but there was no any records available and the second child is 7 years now confirmed hiv positive and mother said she went to antenatal clinic regularly and her blood was taken for hiv and syphilis and vdrl report was available as in non reactive but mother was not told anything about hiv and no records available and she delivered in a teaching hospital no she was not tested at the time of labor and the third child hiv positive now 4 years attended the same antenatal clinic and her records also not available most of it but was able to trace the blood report there was a blood report for her and that was pos uh, 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 noted as negative and uh, she delivered in the same hospital and according to that moh the midwife was not covering at that, that area during that time and the fourth child um, two years now hiv positive that was an unplanned pregnancy uh, she didn't know she was positive at, until the last um, uh, few weeks and she delivered um, in the same teaching hospital and she can't remember that she uh, her blood was um uh, tested for hiv or not so these are the places that can go wrong even uh, with um very comprehensive system so it is very important not to not only to establish the system but also to maintain the system um regularly so with that note i'm going to conclude my uh, uh, speech thank you very much